Hi guys, what you're about to hear is a discussion of stocks that we like among friends. And please note that the view and opinion that we express are solely our own and does not represent any of the company that we work for. And the primary purpose of this podcast is really to educate and inform and the show does not constitute any financial and professional advice. We might also own stocks in some of the company that we are discussing. So please do your own research before making any investment decision. Now, hope you enjoy. Welcome everybody to Kopi in a Year. And this is our latest podcast where we're going to try to pitch a, a stock to each other within our group. We will have guests uh, along the way uh, throughout the year and we will keep track of what we are tracking so that uh, you can view the performance of every stock that we pitch on, on my website, uh, learnwithstanley.com. And at the end of next year, where we review the stock, the winner with the best performing stock will earn a copy from the rest of the group. So that's the idea of Gopi in a year. And today I'm very glad to be joined by two of my guest hosts, John and JP, uh, Jumpat. And welcome everybody. And why don't uh, we give ourselves a, a quick introduction before we get started. Uh, John, why don't you go first? Yeah, uh, thank you, Stanley. Uh, great idea that you're gathering us to, to do this uh, casual chat. Uh, while the winner gets a copy, what, what happens to the loser? He gets shot, is it? Uh, this one we can discuss again, but <laughs> let's keep it, keep it uh, more cordial. Cordial, <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Okay, uh, my name is John. Um, known Stanley for many, many years. Um, and um, in a previous life, I was an engineer with an oil and gas company. I built offshore oil and gas facilities for a living. But um, probably about seven, eight years ago, I decided to do investing full-time in various capacities. And now I actually help our clients with private mandates and also sometimes train people on investing as well as other corporate training. So today I, I do have a stock that um, I would say, I think we, we, we want to be very careful when we say we recommend, right? Something that we, uh, something that I, I favor in a way. Is that mm -hmm. the, the right way to say a favor? Uh, yeah. You, you, uh, of course, this uh, show is more for education purpose, right? And uh, you can share your opinion, but of course, uh, everybody, this is not financial advice. So take it with a pinch of salt and do your own research. Yeah, D Y O R, <laughs> everyone. Okay. So the, I'm actually very uh, enamored with uh, the semiconductor space. Why is because I never worked in that industry before i was uh i guess oil and gas paid so much better when i graduated that you know even though i did electrical engineering i never ended up in semicon space but the company i'm going to talk about today is actually one of the largest semiconductor uh, equipment company in the world and i developed this thesis along the lines of in parallel to the california gold rush so in the california gold rush what the the People who were looking for gold did not actually really strike gold and really make money. But the guys who supplied the jeans, supplied the picks and shovels, those were the guys that made money. And I mean, learning from history, looking at Nokia, looking at BlackBerry, all these guys at the heydays, they were right at the top, right? Mm -hmm. And my thesis developed along the lines that if you are closer to the consumer, you are at the highest risk of getting disrupted. That's my thesis. Okay. But as, as you are further away from the consumer where you don't have the responsibility of building a brand, uh, maintaining customer satisfaction, maintaining the user interface and all that experience, I think that's where a B2B business and this is where uh, the company I'm talking about today, Applied Materials, really stands. Mm. Because regardless of whether it's a Nokia, or whether it's a BlackBerry, whether it's high-performance computing uh, chip from an NVIDIA guy, or whether even TSMC will still be around, you know, in case really, really, right, China and Taiwan goes to war, right? Who are the guys that will supply the picks and shovels to the entire semiconductor chain? And uh, AMAT being AMAT, uh, one of the largest uh, semiconductor front-end equipment suppliers, they supply machines that actually make semiconductor wafers and the customers include uh, wafer, what we call wafer foundries. Uh, they don't have chocolate flavor and strawberry flavor. Uh, it's more of the electronic flavor kind of thing. If it comes, if you want it in peanut butter, I'm sorry, you know, it's just insulated and, you know, it's very shiny and silver. So their clients include anyone that will manufacture a wafer fat. Okay. okay. A wafer, uh, silicon, a 20 inch or 12 inch uh, silicon wafer. And uh, these guys include uh, the likes of Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, 
Uh, it will include guys like Samsung. It will include guys like Intel. So regardless of what brand, uh, whether you are a Huawei fan, whether you are a Nokia fan, mm -hmm. these guys will continue to supply. Uh, they supply equipment like uh, what we call deposition. So you see, when you fabricate a semiconductor wafer, you think of it like a layer cake. You have to put lines where you have to put insulators and you have to put lines where there are conductors. And the material, the, the equipment that applied material uh, supplies help build these layer kicks, you right? Mm -hmm. Either uh, insulation layer or to deposit a, a conductor layer. At the same time, they also have machines that help clean and polish these machines, uh, these wafers, sorry. And um, so that these layers, as they build over and over time, then you, you form a proper, uh, what we call a die. On okay. Currently, they have roughly about 41,000 installed machines globally. And uh, they are the largest among an orgib of five other different players. The beauty about the semiconductor equipment business is that over time, it's so expensive to maintain an R&D that they actually have amalgated. A lot of these guys have done a lot of mergers and acquisitions, amalgated. Mm -hmm. And because of that, only the fittest and the strongest survive. And now it's just an orgib of five players. Right. Okay. Yes. I got so many questions on this. Oh, um, please come. First, because I, I'm also not very familiar with the entire, I, I guess, the vertical integration of uh, of semicon. But uh, why do you at at the first point that you made? Uh, why why do you feel that a uh, company that is doing B two B is less disruptable compared to someone who is on the front end of consumer? Why very, is that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Actually. It, it dawned upon me probably about two to three years ago when, if I share with you the context, uh, one of the companies I invested in in Malaysia, uh, it was this company called Franken. And they do cleaning services. Virtually, the CEO himself, I says, I'm the janitor of the semiconductor business. <laughs> okay. Right. He, he, he's not a chef. He's actually proud of it, right? And when I was questioning him about, hey, what if this happens? What if, you know, this technology shifts or what? Or all this kind of, yeah. Hmm. And he just said that, I don't care, I just clean. So okay. it dawned upon me, right? It says, hey, can I find the toilet paper equivalent kind of business? Right. It means these guys, regardless of what technology changes or whatsoever, they will still remain relevant because they need to partner the guys who design the chip. They need to partner the guys who make the chip. They need to also partner the guys uh, who are in a way the end product, uh, uh, what do you call it? The end product designers. Okay. And why I felt that, you know, as I move further along, look at the brands that seem invincible like four or five years ago or even 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, one change in, look at BlackBerry. I, I'm pretty sure you watched the BlackBerry movie, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Stanley and JP. He was a genius. You know, the, the, yeah. the guy who founded, he was a genius, right? But because of someone else who understood the consumer, who had the intuition to understand the consumer better, just with a flick of a switch, he, co he completely disrupted the thing. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the founders of BlackBerry were still obsessed with keyboards, right? And it says no one's going uh, uh, no one, no to use keyboards. No one's going to use a screen or phone without a keyboard, right? And that kind of, for me, that he felt that he was kind of blindsided. I, I look at the other things about electronically, I think Applier and Stanley, I think you and I are roughly the same age. Uh, they were brands when we were growing up. Sanyo, mm -hmm. Aiwa, <laughs> Panasonic, right? Where are they today? Right. And, and, you know, I feel that more and more of these, especially like simpler electronic devices, even GoPro, I mean, at, during the heyday when GoPro first came out, right, they were like, wow, you know, you got to have a GoPro, right? And where are they today, right? Fitbit, where are they today? But the struggle of being close to the consumer is that if you do not innovate and keep up with the times and you do not maintain your branding uh, strategy, pour lots of money into sales and marketing, at the same time, you need money to do R&D, you know? So you, you're, you're actually stuck on both fronts, you see. If you have a brand, if you're a brand guy, you, you continue building your brand, right? right? Stay, stay there, stay there. Focus okay. on just building your brand, right? Or, or an ecosystem, right? But if you're a technology company, don't try to build a brand and the technology. Not many companies in the world can do that, I feel. That, that's my hypothesis uh, to your question. Uh. I see. But you're saying that, you know, company like applied materials, so uh, regardless of, where the end product might be, it would, you know, the, the company will still need to work with them. Yes. Do they work with all the major brands? Everyone. Also? Everyone. So you think of like, uh, the, okay, so for the context of those who don't understand the con 
third-party contractor wafer foundry business like TSMC. Mm. They manufacture for everyone. You know, everyone's their friend. So AMD will come to them, Apple will come to them, you know, even uh, Intel gets some of their chips manufactured in TSMC. Mm. So AMAT is in that space. Uh, right. But it's even better than TSMC is because the same polishing equipment used by TSMC will be used at Intel, will be used at Infineon, will be used at NXP. Because the technology has been developed over many, many years. Bo, we want to take a guess. How much does applied materials actually spend in R&D in terms of percentage of revenue every year? Take a wild guess. 15? 20? Yeah. Okay. You both of you are quite pretty close. It's <laughs> anyway between 12 to 15%. Okay. Yeah. And at 12 to 15% in terms of quantum, you're talking about anyway between 2 to 4 billion a year, you know? Yeah. And I, I keep on joking with a lot of uh, 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 Malaysian peer investors. They said, okay, oh, we should look at Vitrox. Okay. So mm. Vitrox is about 7 billion ringgit market cap. Yep. So if you divide that to US dollars, it's probably about two, right? Two. So the entire market cap of Vitrox is the one year R&D budget of uh, applied materials. Mm. So that, that's, that's how I, I look at things in the big picture. I mean, like in the ballpark kind of figure. That's how much you need to spend to keep at the end. And the beauty about this Augie Pocky also, uh, guys, is that there are competitors, KLA, Tencor, more of a uh, metallurgy kind of, uh, metrology kind of guy. Uh, you've got someone like Lam, Lam Research, which is also their competitor, but they're more into dry edge. Okay, that's another, that's another rabbit hole. Mm. So the equipment guys themselves, they kind of stay in their lane, if you understand what I mean. Because within the wafer foundry equipment business, there's so many, there's deposition, there's etching, there's uh, polishing, right? And there's even material. So all these require such in-depth knowledge that one, one company cannot possess all of it. Mm. Applied material is the largest, the widest, right? But in terms of dry edge, uh, they have a dry edge machine. They also have a wet edge machine. But in terms of dry edge, LAM is way up there. It's like, it's much better than... So TSMC, what they'll do is this. In order for them not to be beholden to one equipment guy, they will, they will use LAM research for the most expensive dry edge layer, but the secondary or the third one, they will use an applied material one just to make sure there's not of a monopoly. That's the beauty of this business. They, and right. LAM knows that. So they say, I'll focus on dry. Uh, mm. You do some wet, lah. you will overlap some of my equipment, but that's fine. And then metrology, you've got guys like KLA, which is just like, their core focus is, you know, process control, metrology. And, these five guys, they kind of like have this kind of augie poly within the, the industry. And, you know, if they want to enroach into one, they probably have to spend a few billion or they'll buy or they'll, they'll just buy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, JP, you have any question for John? Yeah, probably to, let's say, for example, from a, a layman point of view, probably the so-called equipment manufacturer that they will know of would be ASML, which is yes. the UV manufacturer. So. Right try to help them or even me understand that where does uh, AMAC comes in? Is it before TSMC uses EUV machines or after or it's? That, that's a fantastic question. So maybe I will have to take a step back and I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it as, as short as possible. The start of a process to manufacture a, a semiconductor wafer starts with what we call a silicon ingot. So from a silicon ingot, what, it, what happens is you, you will actually slice it into wafers, all right? And then on the wafer itself, you think of, uh, I don't know uh, what do they call it in Singapore, but in Malaysia, we had this subject called Kemaheran Hidup or uh, Living Skills Class. Living right? Skills, yeah. Uh, living Skills Class. For you to actually imprint a circuit onto that, that circuit board, that copper board, you actually take like a sketching kind of paper and then you draw a, or you imprint a circuit onto that copper board and then you immerse that board into some sort of an acid to actually clean up that lines. So just think of it as a more scaled up, more advanced kind of process, but it's, it's, the principles are exactly the same. So you've got this silicon wafer, right? Then they will actually layer the silicon wafer with what we call a photo mask. So you think of it as like you need, you need when you want to like take a photograph and you, your, your, your paper, right? You want to print that paper, a photograph on a paper, there's like a glossy layer or whatever. Think of that same uh, analogy or principle. You, you imprint that layer on that silicon wafer. And this is where ASML will come in. They would actually photocopy, for the lack of a yeah. better word, or, or mm -hmm. print that circuit 
onto this photo, uh, onto this silicone layer with a mask. And then once they need to actually remove the layers that they do not want, this is where machines like Emmet or, uh, or LAM Research will actually come in. They would actually okay. remove or what we call etch away these layers that are unwanted. And then the process repeats itself because then another layer will need to be formed, which is the layer cake, right? Then ASMLs, it will go back to ASMLs lithography. And uh, to your second part of the question in which does it really need EUV? No, it has been, uh, the L machines has been around even since the DUV, uh, deep uh, ultraviolet days. Uh, so it can be used in old technology or new technology because the L purpose of the machine is actually, think of it as a removal, putting on layers, removal, putting on layers, and then polishing. Whereas uh, ASML's machines are photocopy, photocopy, photocopy. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the simplest way I would describe uh, that analogy. Yeah. Okay. Understand a little bit more, uh, but maybe I give a, a, a explain it in a different analogy from what I understand from you. Sure. Say yes. in the automotive uh, manufacturing plant, right? Yes. Say if you assume that TSMC is the is the is the factory that built up the car. Yes. And applied materials and research. Those are the guys that are supplying the components. Maybe like the brakes. No, no. Supply or... the machines to, to do make the, the brakes. Okay, to make the brakes and to yes. make the exhaust. But each of them specialize in one area. Correct. Right. Perfect. Actually, think of them like uh, if you give an automotive a factory, think of them like a Kuka robot lah, mm-hmm. or uh, you know the painting painting robots. Yeah. Ah, so they supply yeah. the robots, right? They supply the robots. That's right. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay, then in that case, uh, for applied material, is this a company that you feel is a, you know, buy and hold kind of company, or you do feel that at some point, uh, at what situation would you plan to sell them? Great question again. For me, I, I my style is more of a buy and hold, and that's why sometimes a lot of my portfolios or even my clients' portfolios, they are there's a lot of inaction. Mm-hmm. Why is we we wait for we wait for prices to come to us. And for this particular company, there are opportunities where you can actually uh, kind of, for the lack of a better word, time the cycle. Mm-hmm. Now, the applied materials machines, uh, they don't go obsolete within a year or two. It is usually between the three or five year cycle before some of, some of their machines are still running over 10, 15 years from now. And their cycle peaks at uh, when there is a new build out of uh, wafer foundries. So if you see that more and more wafer foundries are being built, that's where you see an uptake of these machines uh, being uh, being bought because there's a cycle. Ma. Once you, it's like you want to build a factory, you're not going to replace your machine every year, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not like a candy store. So when there's an uptake, so if, uh, the leading indicator would be if you see an uptake in, uh, let's say the CHIPS Act, you know, US pouring 50, 53 billion and you start to see uh, onshoring of these wafer foundries within the US, then there will be an uptick of um, machines being bought by by uh, by the wafer foundries from applied materials during a low period, and uh, when you know most of the wafer foundries have already been built, then a lot of their revenue generation, profit generation comes from existing services, uh, services to existing machines. So that's how uh, it's roughly about the biggest chunk is obviously still machine sales, but I think about uh, one third or one quarter of their revenue today comes from servicing the existing machines. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Adding this to my watch list. But uh, also, you know, uh, when you say they are supplying to, uh, uh, they're supplying the machine for, for the process, yes. then I link back to, you know, your industry in oil and gas. They are something like a Halliburton or okay, so a Schumberger providing the... I would say because Slumberger and Halliburton, they provide both the equipment and the service. Mm-hmm. I would give them an analogy of someone like, okay, a solar turbine. Okay. Or a pump. Because mm-hmm. you can, once you get the machine up and running, it's kind of like, it's like you can get the TSMC guys to maintain. Whereas for a Slumbridge or Halliburton kind of service and equipment they bring in, the, op- the operator, which is Shell, Exxon, or, or even uh, Petronas, they, are, they won't be allowed to touch the equipment. Okay. Yeah. So they would be, I would say an AMAT would be similar to that of like a solar turbine or a Schutzer Palm or an Atlas Copco, a very interesting company as well. Atlas okay. Copco, they provide, they supply what we call air compressors. So they compress air for, uh, for the platform and use it for pneumatic services. So once it's installed, the technicians on the platform will be trained to, to, to uh, maintain them and it's left alone. 
and this, that's the same applies for applied materials. The TSMC guys or whatever, they will know how to operate and maintain it. Only when there's big issue, then they're flying these guys. Uh. Right. Yeah, Slumberger, Halliburton, the operator wouldn't even uh we wouldn't even be allowed to touch the equipment because it's too complicated, too expensive. Uh they will be doing like Y line services, well tests and all that. That one, what what we normally do when we get them in, it's a bundle contract. This is your scope, your equipment, anything, your problem. You just give us the output, what we want. I hope I clarified the analogy. Understand. Understand. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. JP, any more follow-up question for him? Yeah, I think um, what makes AMAT stands out apart from it um, being having having more a wider mode, I would say, from the analogy that they do look at more stuff, even though that um, in certain sub-segments or certain niche, like LAM research, they do better by etching. But why um, AMAT intrigue you more than you know, LAM research or other players? I think I've always been looking at these five, uh, Jupan, and it was a great question. Uh, it, it's actually in terms of valuation, the 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 more palatable one because LAM, LAM uh, I'm also a shareholder of LAM. LAM, when I got it, was probably about 28, 30 times. Now it's probably, at, at the peak, it was probably close to 44, 50 times. So in terms of revenue size and everything, AMAT is much bigger. But as as you rightly pointed out, they are, uh, they are wider. They're wider. LAM is more niche. Uh, but the beauty of what uh, Applied Materials has is just imagine because you have a wider equipment base, imagine the data set that you're getting all from your that one. So that was uh, appeal number one. Uh, appeal number two was obviously valuations. Uh, right now, it's uh, not to say very demanding, probably about 24, 25 times, right? Uh, last 12 months. And um, yeah, I think th those two. And what I also realized is that these five guys, as I alluded earlier, they're starting to play more and more in their own lane. Now. And and they say that, okay, Lam, you want to be king of dry, go ahead. <laughs> I'll be king of wet, you know. And then uh, we 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 collaborate together because I know if I want to step into your turf, I be better be prepared to spend another extra billion <laughs> in R and D to, to be as good as you, you see. Uh, KLA, you stay, you stay in metrology, right? You 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 handle that part. I will probably cannibalize a little bit, but you can see that most of them are staying in their lane. Now. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Any last word, John, before we move no, on? No, no. Wonderful. We didn't even talk about numbers. Uh, it, it's, it's good that it's you good remember. remember. Oh, okay. yeah. So just uh, very broad numbers, 26 billion uh, in terms of uh, revenue last year. Uh, in terms of net profit, probably close to about 7, 7.3. Um, you're talking about, you know, super healthy balance sheet and they have a net, they are actually a net cash. No, they are not net cash. Yeah, they are it. They're just a net cash. Just a net cash. And in terms of valuation, not so demanding. Lah. So that's, you know, I think on the risk side, probably one thing I want before I end is while I sing praises about them, hmm. the struggle will be to keep up with what we call more than more. Because for those of you within the, uh, who are, are not familiar with Moore's Law, Moore's Law is actually a law created by, by this guy. And he actually predicted that the circuitry will double every three to five years. We are coming to somewhat of a limit to Moore's Law. And the struggle for any equipment guys, including AMAT, is like, can they stretch the laws of physics to actually go on to the next phase. And it's actually not just AMAT's responsibility, but also a combination of the industry players who are also their, their clients to actually play along with them. So that kind of like is one of the big risks that if you were to look into this company, that, that's what you have to be looking at. Understand. Yeah. Thank you very much for that interesting company, uh, Applied Materials. And the ticker is AMAT, AMAT uh, on Nasdaq. Right now it's about just give some some stats. Right now it's about 170 billion US dollar company. Cool. Okay. So on my side, uh, I think I'll go next. My name is Stanley, and I run the YouTube channel Learn with Stanley, and I'm also a wealth advisor with IFAS Global Market uh, in Malaysia right now. And uh, I mainly help clients uh, build diversified portfolio. And today I will also talk about a company in the US but in a completely different industry and maybe one that is easier to understand. I would say it's a very Buffett-like investment. And this company 
right now is operating in sort of a duopoly kind of industry in the sugar water industry, in the success sub-segment. So in the energy drink segment, and I'd like to talk about uh, Monster Beverage, Monster uh, Energy and Monster Beverage Company. Ooh. Interesting because actually I found, uh, I, I, I started looking at this company mainly because I was very fascinated with the story of Red Bull. Lah. But as you guys know, Red Bull is a, is a, is a privately held company and the founder, uh, the co-founder from Australia recently passed and uh, that led me to uh, found out that Monster is actually listed and interestingly enough I think Monster actually created their their company very similar time frame as Red Bull was uh, it was actually a turnaround company so previously it was a fruit juice company called Hanson and two guys basically uh, bought over the bankrupt company and the two guys uh, interestingly is also from South Africa a lot of great entrepreneurs from South Africa coming to the US and uh, from these two guys called Rodney Sachs and Hilton Schulberg I hope I didn't pronounce it wrongly but they also make some uh, they make their wealth in South Africa but then they migrated to the US and they, when they migrated over they basically start anew and they just uh, look around to see if there's any shell company or, or, or troubled company to buy. And they come across this company who is facing bankruptcy called Hanson. And they took it over uh, with a million dollars in 1992. But the company has $12 million of, $12 million of debt uh, at that time. So they were trying anything. Uh, right? Because the beverage business was not... They are, they are forte. One, one of them is a lawyer. The other is a serial entrepreneur. So they know nothing about uh, hand drinks, but they were just uh, experimenting with different uh, brands, trying to re revive the Hanson brand. Um, by 2002, they realized that the energy drink sector is, is booming. And so they founded uh, the beverage called Monster Beverage uh, by, by that time. Equally, during that time, that was when Red Bull started to found some success in, in their Red Bull drinks around the world. It was already quite big in the in Europe, but not so much in the US. So then uh, Monster Energy kind of uh, used that concept and started in, in the US as well. So it took them quite, uh, uh, I think, quite fast once they started Monster Energy and found success with it. Within five years, they more or less pay down all the debt of the company and they are able to, to start growing it. And interestingly, they also use the playbook of Red Bull mainly. So it's more or less a marketing company, right? Mm. And they, they use a lot of extreme sports and stunts to market their, their brand. Uh, in the past, they found some trouble mainly with distribution. So although they have the drink, but they don't have that wide of a distribution network. And so what they do is they have been trying very hard to just partner with all the other big guys out there. They partnered before with PepsiCo, with AB, with Dr. Peppers. They try to just use their network and license for them to distribute it. But they found finally in the last few years, last last decade, I think, found the perfect match, which is they got a, a huge investment from Coca-Cola. And in return, Coca-Cola become their biggest shareholder, but also take over most of their bottling and also distribution. So now they just have to handle a lot of the marketing stuff. Uh, distribution more or less is handled by Coca-Cola side or, or Coca-Cola bottlers side. Um, they spend close to you know five hundred six hundred to a million dollars a year on on marketing alone, um, and also lobbying uh, for for health purposes. But today they have a few segment, mainly energy drink, Monster, and they have other brands as well. Uh, they have what they call a segment brand which they sell the ingredients and the formula, more like, like OEM, but that's not very big. And they have also started to venture into beers as well. So uh, a little bit of beers and of course uh, licensing, uh, their, their monster brand on licensing. So I like this company mainly because of the usual good operating matrix, right? Margin, net margin, more than 20%, uh, growing company, uh, ROI very very good. Uh, not so much of that. 
and more or less the leaders uh, uh, in terms of market share are uh, close to neck to neck with uh, Red Bull, uh, especially in the US. Um, that's, that's more or less why I like them. Uh, yeah, and th their marketing has been very, very strong um, so far. More or less, that's the thesis. <laughs> and I continue to see it growing. Wonderful, Stanley. Um, why do you think they are not as big here in Asia? Maybe that's the first one I want to start off with. Okay, so for Asia, I guess also that energy drink is not really that big of a, a cultured drink for us. Mm. I don't know. I haven't met any real people that uh, drink energy drink on a regular basis. Right, even even it's the same, right? If if even like uh, things like Coca Cola, is extremely you know it's like a daily drink in the US or, or North America, but over here we drink it, but we don't really drink it on a very very regular basis for most of us. One is also I think maybe of on Cosa, right? To to them in the in the US or in in Europe, uh, this beverage is considered one of the cheaper ones. Yeah, water is more expensive than uh, than the energy drink, right? And the Coca Cola, uh, but for us, it's uh, a a little bit more like a novelty already. Yeah. Plus, I guess we are also part of uh, you know, most of us are a tea drinking culture also. Mm. So we our alternative to maybe caffeine as beside coffee, maybe is is also tea. That might be that. That's just roughly what I feel lah. Uh, but you're right. You say monster uh, net sales are still uh in Asia less than ten percent mm. in Asia also Latin America less than ten percent uh, mostly of the sales still coming from uh North America mainly U S and Canada and uh, also Europe but Europe uh, interestingly is also not that big compared to them like U S and Canada is roughly three times bigger than their Europe market I guess Europe is still more dominant for Red Bull lah, since they are headquartered there. Yeah. I, actually, perhaps the reason why I asked that question is, is it, I'm trying to understand, is it more of a culture or is it more of a marketing or distribution kind of constraint hmm. to, to understand that whether they can grow in Asia and also grow grow in Europe, where, which is not their strength country. Lah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, maybe Jupan, the floor is yours for questions. Yeah, I think I did a quick check. I think they have also... Um, kind of pivoted or went with the trend that um, sugar, the, the general consensus is that maybe most of the current trend is skewed towards sugar-free. Mm -hmm. So I think a quick check, their products are sugar-free. I think the energy is derived from caffeine. Mm -hmm. So I mean, from even if they want to, you know, potentially come to Asia, it, it could be a potential opening. But I, I think that over in Asia, we do have current energy players who are very strong, like Hydro Plus. And I think it's also a very niche segment that we don't see other existing FMCG players going into that particular rabbit hole as well. So, yeah, I think, yep. um, yeah, apart from that, you also mentioned that they went, ventured into beer, so, but they are just purely within the beverage segment. And when you talk about our logistics, um, the, the action or the task of moving liquid from one end to another is actually quite a, a costly kind of a, one of the huge components of, a, of the product cost, right? Yes, but I would I, I would say the main cost for them is still marketing uh, mainly. Uh, at the end of the day, they are making something that is maybe 50 cents selling it for three, two, three dollars. So uh, most of it is still coming from marketing and distribution. The material cost, what they have is, I guess, the formula that they hold themselves, which is their IP. But I, I don't think this industry is something that is uh like uh it is it, not that hard to disrupt lah, right? I, I feel they have a moat, but it's not indestructible because only last few years US also have a new energy drink called Celsius, right? And Celsius is growing very, very strong. Uh, Celsius also listed. Of course it's still not profitable. So they are uh, like burning a lot of money just to gain market share and they use different kind of marketing. I feel compared to Monster, Monster and Red Bull use the extreme, uh, very big budget production kind of marketing. You know, Red Bull even have their own F1 team, right? Two F1 team actually, just to do marketing. Uh, but Celsius grow through mainly uh, using social media and using influencer a lot from that. So, you know, it's interesting to see how they can compete with that like, in the future, right? Generally, Celsius have grown, 
but Monster and Red Bull still are maintaining their market share also. So the, the pie is still growing for everyone. And yeah, I think I have one more question. Mm, so on. with the current craze of the weight loss drug like Ozempic and Wigobi, do you foresee that um, sales from Monster Beverage could be affected? You mean like the trend of going, becoming healthier? Yeah, uh, cutting down uh, intake of um, food or beverages. Generally, I, okay, so I have a different view on, on this. La. I, I feel that the, the concept of like going healthier, less sugar has been around for a very long time, but yet we see all this sugar drink and snacks company uh, sales is still going up. So it means that, most people are saying some, a saying one thing, but I guess they're doing another, right? <laughs> and I feel all these kind of drinks slowly they become more or less like almost like addiction. Mm. So, so when you get used to it and and you are part of your daily routine, then uh, it's something that uh, it becomes subconscious for people and they continue to buy. So that's I don't see the trend of going healthy would really disrupt them that much whereas where i see the threat mostly interestingly is, is i feel the concept of convenience store and petrol petrol kiosk uh convenience store so most of the sales uh, distribution still coming from like uh, the 7-eleven and the convenience store in petrol petrol station mm. so uh when the model of petrol station change where especially when we go into ev and everything where they charge and then this petrol station might become a, a more a much bigger recreation rest area with restaurant with shopping malls with more distraction rather than just a small shop you know i i, I see that that might be a threat to them for catching the eyeball of a uh, passer travelers uh, and buying that so that is yet to be seen how how you play out but uh, i guess that affects you know uh, both them and also their their investor Coca Cola, so they have a good partner in 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 worrying on that part together. Uh, it's interesting that you brought up the convenience thing. So did they actually break down sales through uh, like large large format retail stores like Walmart or Costco versus that convenience? Is it is it like two times three times more uh... that they actually sell from the convenience store? Did they actually break down to that kind of detail? Okay, I don't have the numbers right here don't think they break down specifically but just mm -hmm. reading through the annual report it sounds like they, it's they implying that is it they mentioned you know some of the key main distribution points for them yeah uh, it's it's interesting because the pick and go kind of format uh, works to their advantage versus that of they'll buy and then they'll sit at home it's like Mm. You, you're not going to buy a tequila and sit at home and drink on your yeah, own, right? Most yeah. of the time, you'll buy a tequila and you go socialize and things like that. Yeah, I think that was probably the, the crux of my question. Maybe one last question for me. They had the threat of other brands, like, you know, you mentioned Celsius coming in and all that. And you, you mentioned that in, in terms of where their strength really is as a marketing, not so much distribution because now Coca-Cola has system in that. And in terms of IP, do you think the IP or the, the formulation of the drinks play a very important role? Or do you think that if they even if they lose that, you know, that IP for that drink, it really still boils down to the brand strength that they have built over the years of their marketing? Which one do you think is more important from your point of view? Definitely the brand to me. Uh, to me, mm. I feel definitely the brand is more important. And they are just within the energy drink space, they are only you know one of the two with Red Bull together that has the budget to really market through all avenues, uh, mm. right? To all avenues and they are the ones that they can sponsor sports clubs. They are the ones that, you know, can can sponsor the whole stadium and things like that. So uh, at the end of the day, they will have the biggest outreach compared mm. to the rest, which is why, you know, although I see Celsius growing very fast, they, mm. more or less they have to do like a gorilla style Marketing, marketing, you know, to to compete with them, it's almost impossible. They don't, they would not have the budget to to compete directly. Uh, on on buying like uh eyeball space. Yeah, uh, with, with yeah. Monster it's like, yeah, it's like if you want to get a Super Bowl space for Celsius, uh, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Versus exactly. that of now, I'm just looking at the numbers for 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 Monsters Beverage SG and A lumped together is probably about one point eight billion last year. 
Yeah. But out of that, I don't know how much is in marketing. They haven't, yeah, I'm because I'm looking from 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 ticker. So I've not looked at the annual report, but I'm guessing it should be in the close to the billion kind of billion dollar kind of range every year. Like, marketing. Yeah. yeah. I I will assume it's you know at least a 15 to 20 percent range of their sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So maybe you have any last words, uh, Stanley, for, for this before we move on to Japan? Uh, no. Uh, so th- that's basically more or less my thesis. And I, I would say uh, right now, I feel this is a kind of a company that I, I'm not, uh, I'm quite okay to buy and hold. Mm. But of course, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have to monitor them. Mm. And I mentioned some of the threat and one of the main indicator that we can monitor is just looking at their uh, margins. Uh. When we see their margins starting to compress, then that could be something of a warning sign for us. Yeah, that, that's a good one. I think uh, gross, I mean, looking at, at the trend right now, uh, at the peak, it was probably about 63, 64% uh, in 2016. Now it's roughly about 54%, Stanley. Mm. So, but still keeping above the uh, 50, more than 50% gross, uh, which is yep. still very, very healthy, uh, to be honest. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Stanley. Thank you, Stanley. No problem. And now we have our last uh, last talk of the of the night. Uh, Jupan, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself first? Sure. So my name is Jupan. Um, I graduated as a food scientist. I spent three years at a global renowned sea food manufacturing company before pivoting into a, it's a technical role back then. So I pivoted into a more business centric role industry for six years. And then for the past one year plus, I switched and pivot my career again into risk management solutions. So we offer risk management, tailor risk management solutions to companies within the commodities. So in a way, still within the food industry as well. On the side, I got bitten by the investing bug, I think, eight years ago. And it just became never-ending rabbit hole where you go dipping, digging into different, different kinds of business model, understanding them more. And then if it fits your philosophy or business philosophy, then I will approach more or less the buy and hold approach. And the company that I want to introduce today um, kind of came to me two times, right? So the first time was seven, uh, in, 20, in 20, 2007. So when I was still interning at a food manufacturing plant, the company's name came to me, but then I didn't have any knowledge, no interest in investing. And the second time the company came to me uh, was last year. So I just happened to stumble upon this company again and was like, hey, I know this company and let's see what it does on um, how it's still, how, do, how do the numbers look like and at a period of time where everyone was just talking about tech and we see tech stocks going up. And of course, there was a few sell downs um, across this year and I look at my portfolio and I need to have something to help cushion this sell off so that it doesn't look that bad whenever I look at it, right? And so this company is called Lindy PLC. So it's a company that manufactures and distributes industrial gas. So back then when I was with the food manufacturing company doing my intern, basically I saw this, you know, tanker delivering gases every day nonstop. So I asked my senior, what, what, what is this kind of company? I mean, we are making, making meat patties, we are making, you know, frozen hamburger patties. Why is this company out of blue coming to deliver something that we don't see in the product? So um, he said that, oh, you actually must know that um, this company actually delivers um, liquefied nitrogen gas and also carbon dioxide. And even though you don't see it directly inside the product, it actually plays an important role in the entire process. So um, nitrogen helps to you know lower down the food or uh, the product temperature to freeze to freeze it as fast as possible so that it's easier. Is it me or is it him? I think it's him. I'm just getting it's... excited on Linde. Yeah I was just I was already like googling already, googling. already. <laughs> on my on my ticker already. So <laughs> okay we'll wait for him to come back. Oh JP is uh, back. Welcome back. Uh let me I'm see. so so sorry. No worries. Let me see how I can get Bring you back. back. Come back yeah, maybe you start again. Lah. Uh, you better the you... company you want to introduce is? Okay, the company that I want to introduce is Linde TLC. So the company, the business model is basically um the company the company does is um yeah, they manufacture, I would say not 
to say manufacture, but um, a part of their business is actually just separating, you know, the different types of air available in the air we breathe. So the air we breathe, uh, it consists of nitrogen, it consists of oxygen, a little bit of, um, you know, rare gases like krypton, neon, xenon. So each of these every gas, when you concentrate and you purify, they have their own uses. So as nitrogen mainly used in um, food manufacturing and other kinds of businesses, oxygen, of course, in the medical field. And then there's also process gas where they will take a feedstock, a raw gas, and then further manufacture it, it into hydrogen, carbon dioxide, helium, etc. So these gases on its own purified have each of their own uses and vital to every of the clients that they actually serve. So they do serve quite a big list or uh, wide scope of uh, clients. So the clients come from the healthcare industry, come from the F&B industry, the electronics, your semiconductor, chemicals, energy, manufacturing, and also uh, metals. So you also need to have gases in the steel making front. So this company chance upon to me, uh, I think last year, uh, when I was going through um, some other companies to diversify away a bit from tech because tech has been the craze. Uh, Magnificent 7 was always going up and coming over to the age where it's all about AI, it's all about chips. And we have seen some sell-offs this year as well. So I was looking for something to complement my existing por portfolio, which I think is a bit too tech AV. And it does hurt a bit when, when you see, um, you know, everything goes down at the same time because Magnificent 7 got sold off at the same time when, when AI stocks or the chip stocks got sell off as well. So I was looking for something to cushion. And this company came to me um, last year when I came then. I saw their earnings. Um, on CNBC, if not mistaken. So it looks like a very defensive business. So even though they still serve some of the companies within the semiconductor space, but putting everything aside and looking at it holistically, they actually do serve very defensive sectors like what I mentioned, FMCG, healthcare. In the event there's any downturn in semiconductor, yes, it will get affected, but you will not still get sell off like 20%, 30% in one day. And if semiconductor does picks up, it still does get to piggyback uh, on any catalyst from the AI or the semiconductor scene. So because it's a very um, capex intensive business, usually how they work with their customers is that once the customers have an existing or new plant, they will sign a contract and say, okay, Lindy, I will just pick you as my partner. Since I'm going to need so much of this particular gas, can you just build uh, this particular plant just next, right, right, right beside me. And then you just apply me for across the contractual period of 15 to 20 years. So this is one way they help or they work with their customers, which is uh, adjacent infrastructure, very long-term contract of 15 to 20 years. And then they are the smaller players where, yeah, I might not need you to build a plant adjacent to me, but I need constant supply. Maybe every day you send in a tanker whatsoever. Yeah, it can be done. Linde also does that kind of um, solution or delivery format. And then lastly, the smaller players, which you don't need to send in a tanker or a truck, but they do have this gas cylinders where they can, you know, um, send in every time uh, when required. And then that means that Linde just serves the big boys up to the um, small players out there. So, so long if you need industrial gas, they are one of the uh, go to players, and it's also an industry which is an oligopoly. There are only a handful of big players within this scene. So, Lindy is one of them. They are the biggest. They became the biggest because Praxair merged with Lindy to form the current Lindy. So, back then, Praxair was just mainly um, US. They are very strong in US, whilst Lindy was strong in Europe and also Asia. When they merged the business together, they ultimately created a monster industrial gas player, um, which in terms of revenue and size puts them at the largest among the five. So there's also Air Liquid, a uh, French company doing the same thing. There's also Air Products, a US company also doing the same thing. And then there's also a Japanese one called Hayo Nippon Sign. So basically headquartered in Japan. The other thing that I wanted to take note or to understand more is that, okay, seems like this company is everywhere. So are they also in China? Because when we talk about, uh, you know, Magnificent 7, most of our, the Magnificent 7 have little to 
not a lot of uh, presence in China. So save apart from uh, Apple I, iPhones, where they do still have quite a bit of uh, sales coming from there. But we talk about Google, totally not there, right? And um, I want to see whether this company is really tapping onto all geographical uh, regions. They are still they are they are actually also there in China. So com uh, together with Aliquid, their products, they basically form the top four industrial gas players. So they are basically every day is very concentrated. Um, the globe in their hands. So it's just getting more sales from your existing competitors or trying to work out better growth revenues in terms of you know, better growth in terms of revenue and margins by you know, optimizing their process as well. Great. I mean, great, great find. In terms of like um, the geographical dispersion, as you rightly put, is almost uh, everywhere. Maybe to help me understand their business uh, unit economics better, Juparn. Yeah. When there are large uh, clients when they want or they want to secure a large volume. So, who forks up the capex to build those gas plants? For is it is it a fifty fifty between the client or the client pays them and then is built to transfer and operated by Linde or is built to transfer operated by by the what they call it by the client themselves? What's the I model? think there are various kinds of arrangements depending on. Uh, each of the client's requirement, but I think most of the capex is uh the infrastructure is being made mainly owned by Lindy. Mm. So they will sign a contract, and then for the large players or large clients, basically they will just set cost escalations across the the throughout the contractual life of the supply. And mm -hmm. then of course there will be times where because when it comes to segregating an air separation, the major element of cost is energy because energy is required to you know, uh, separate uh, different different types of air from each other or even run mm. through different different process. In the event there's a cost surge, Lindy does also build that extra cost pass through to their clients as well. I see. So this is how they manage ambiguity in terms of, you know, setting a long-term contract, but they have successfully passed through this um, energy cost because you can't even hedge something, you can't hedge energy costs 15, yeah. 20 years down the road, right? Yeah. But they have yeah. managed to do that uh, quite consistently and you can see from their operating margin, um, it's even better compared to uh, before Prax and, and Linde actually merged. Mm. So I think right now they are doing 22% as of their latest fiscal year. I see. It's quite good for some for, for a company that has, you know, a capex intensive business, 20% operating margin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the past, they used to even drop to about 11%, I think, looking at it, 2019, uh, yeah. margins, yeah. Great. So, uh, so, so you're saying the margin is uh, sustainable. Sustainable. Well, Revenue-wise, you don't see them growing that much, but yeah. they have just have the knack of um, optimizing the processes. You can see that um, revenue, I think, uh, don't go to, at, at most, uh, 10 to 11% mm. uh, in terms of uh, growth, but they just have the knack of growing their uh, net profitability and so their earnings per share and they have also had the knack of uh, being generous in terms of returning value to shareholder by doing generous share buybacks and also paying out dividend as well and the good thing about this company is after the merger and the reorganization uh, it's actually domiciled in ireland headquartered mm -hmm. in Woking, uk so the dividends that you get does not go the 30% withholding tax. Mm, Even right. though you are getting a US dollar denominated dividend. Yeah, the Irish domicile thing. Yes. A, a few questions I have. Um, When you say they serve a, a wide range of industry, do they break it down? Like uh, what's the yeah. main industry they, they serve? Yeah, so they served um, healthcare and beverage, electronics, chemical, manufacturing, and also uh, metals and mining. So they call... um. The healthcare, uh, food and beverage, um, business, um, the defensive ones, in a pie chart format, sixty two percent of their sales are to this defensive business. Where else the body, uh, remaining one is what you call the cyclical business, so semiconductor, electronics. This is why, um, from that aspect, I'll be like, okay, if this is a company that serves or is positioned in a more def defensive sector. Yeah, I definitely want to look into it because I don't want to add another company which will go down if there is a tax sell-off. And uh, 
for those who have a tech concentrated portfolio and they are looking to you know mitigate some of this sell off if it does happen i think yeah it's a it's a company to look at it isn't quite cheap right now i think 31 times pe ratio um, it's a big company 250 billion us dollar market cap but um yeah i will wait for a, a cheaper price to actually you know take a position in this company and adopt the buy and hold approach because they have consistently beaten the S&P um, for the past, I think, six, seven years. I'm just having a difficult time to understand wh- where exactly is the moat here. Because you say that, okay, they, they work in an oligopoly kind of industry, but yeah. yet, you know, their, their job is mainly separating the gases, right? Yes. And this is not something that is, you know, have a secret formula or what is quite basic chemistry and the cost is mainly electricity like you say right so why the industry ends up being an oligopoly in this case where you know it doesn't seem to have that do they have any technical advantage or you know is it just is it just scale i think scale pays plays an important part um it's very capex intensive no sane person would want to suddenly have a light up uh, idea and say that I'm going to go and challenge you know the existing industry players uh, and the industrial gas players um in the current scenario in the currency. There's also a bit of patent and also uh technical know-how in terms of um, separating air um ensuring supply. So I think at first it started off with knowing how to separate the gas efficiently with the purity and at the speed that you can cater to your clients. But soon, sooner or later, when you reach a certain size, um, you need to serve more customers and these customers can be everywhere. And you can't build an infrastructure or air separation plant everywhere else in the world. So putting it in this way that the current plant that they are set up must have that kind of vision or insight that, okay, this plant, once it's set up, it can serve the requirements of clients potentially in the vicinity because it's very inefficient and also costly to transport gas. So they have had this network built over time since the business started until it gone through this year, uh, until it gone through with the current phase, whereby so long as you have you have a plan or you have a business that requires gas within the network that Lindy currently has, um, the company will be eventually able to help sort it out and deliver this um, gases to you. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, John also mentioned that um, the ex Mox, you know, uh, CEOs or, or the management team went out and, and you know, found the KGB, which is basically the same model, but it would take KGB a very, very long time for them to actually firstly gain market share and also to have that kind of network that the big players have today. So, and you look at how Lindy has been growing, um, and how they have been growing uh, all these years. They don't actually keep on building plants. They have had acquisitions. They have been going around looking at smaller companies, which is strategic to their, you know, growth roadmap and then paying a fair price and, you know, just owning the current existing facilities or the infrastructure. So it doesn't need to be always building, but they so, so, so happened that back then they were the biggest and they have been very, you know, opportunistic in terms of growing their network of, uh, infrastructure and also distributions by doing uh, acquisitions of small companies. Yeah, I think you rightly pointed out also something that because of their sheer size, uh, Jupan, KGB is more anchored around providing engineering services and construction services where they don't need to load up the balance sheet. But because of that, then their struggle is uh, revenue is lumpy. Lah. You always have to replenish your order book. Whereas I think when I look at Linde, I was just going, while you were explaining, I was just going through some of Linde's reports. I think being on site, being close to the customer by building this facility, as well as, you know, the question that, you know, Stanley asked, you know, it's, it's gas is commoditized, you know, what, what makes them so special? What, what's their mode, right? I think it's also maybe looking at, looking at it from another angle, uh, probably would it be fair for me to also make this opinion that customers may want to pay for a brand that has a certain reputation to say, hey, okay, if Linde is going to build my gas plant to supply my hospital, right? Uh, they, are, they are staking their reputation on the line that, you know, I'm going to get my consistent 
quality industrial gases. They have uh, probably a blueprint that they've learned from previous builds because they've built so many, right? So it's just really like just uh, photostatting, copying best practices from, you know, different places around the world. I think that that's an advantage that I presume that they would have because if you build one, there's bound to be mistakes. You build yeah. two, you build three, you build four, after you build a few hundred, then you, you kind of have like, uh, some sort of an engineering IP. I don't, I don't think it's a very large mode, but I think it would take someone like KGB, I think more years and more capex on, on their balance sheet to be able to build that kind of size and network, lah, like what you mentioned. Lah. Whereas, yeah, you can come out, you can start lean, but you do engineering services, but you will never own and you know uh, earn revenue from some sort of a recurring model where you lease uh, and then you know take a pay. It's like a... For the lack of a better word, I think of them like an IPP instead of energy, but this is for industrial gas. Am I correct to say this? Yeah. Yeah. IPP, but IPP for independent power producer, but this one is an independent gas producer. Reliable pro uh, production and a reliable uh, supply. La. Correct. Yeah. But I'm very sure they have to underwrite some kind of risk contract or so. If you screw up the purity of my gas or whatever, Linde. Definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we had a very interesting chat about Chuck, but story for another day. Uh, okay, to unpack the insurance industry. I guess I have the one last question for, for Jopat is, uh, you know, uh, why Linde compared to, say, just now, uh, air product, air liquid, uh, are they, do you not see them doing the same thing sooner or later, like uh, improving their margins and everything? Yeah, so the threat, I, I, see, them, I see them from a threat point of view. So if Linde's performance or their quality in terms of delivering services does falter, then very easily you screw me up. Client says, you screw me up, I'm going to find air liquid or air products. But I think from operating matrices, from margin perspective, from return of equity, return of capital, Linde has been proven uh, giving better kind of returns to their shareholders. They have been more consistent growing their margins and also their revenue. Even though they are the biggest, right? They are already so big, but still they can grow faster than the So there must be some magic sauce that puts the biggest player in the industry still growing faster than them, outpacing their competitors. So usually we see smaller players, they are more agile, um, they are able to you know grow at a faster speed. In this case, when you compare Linde against air liquid and also air products, Linde still is much more superior when it comes to growth and also their margins. Okay. Any other question from, from John? No, no. Uh, I think uh, I'm good. I like Linda's business model, actually. Uh, actually there's another company uh, that we may explore in the future, Spyrex Sparkle, that sells, sells Steam. Mm. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh, also in the UK, I was introduced this company by Pat Dossie. Pat Dossie likes it. Okay. Uh, the Pat former Dossie. CIO of Morningstar. I haven't done a deep dive yet on Spyrex, but very similar. But instead of industrial gas, they sell steam. Yeah, industrial steam to the the end users because uh, sterilization of equipment, all that kind of thing. So I'm like, wow, steam also can sell. Interesting, uh, interesting time to be alive, right? <laughs> when you yeah, have these yeah. kind of businesses. Yeah. Collect all the steam while you're in the toilet, uh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> or sell sell methane gas unpurified <laughs> methane gas okay interesting okay uh, keep some bullets yeah, for next time no problem <laughs> uh, thank you so much guys uh, what is uh, it's I always enjoy chatting with you guys and uh, a big motivation for me to to get you guys all together is also you know, having having this uh, discussion again so that we can talk to each other more often and thank you so much for discussing on the company today uh, mainly applied materials Linde and also Monster Beverage Company. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy uh, our discussion. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But for, for everyone listening, please note that the view and opinion that we express are solely ours and does not necessarily represent those of the company that we represent. Right. And the purpose of this podcast really is just to educate and also inform. So it doesn't constitute any financial advice. Uh, we do own stocks in some of the shares that we are discussing in the show. So please remember to do your own research when you're making any investment decision. All right. Thank you very much, guys. And I hope to chat with you guys real soon. Thank yep. you, Stanley. Thank you for hosting. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, John. Thank yep. you. Thank See you, you. Japan. Right.